Then, second man is by R.C. Walls. In fact, they taught uh, CR raw when you are given to ISI. Did it in the 47th of Direct Dynasty, and rather was Professor Barnomics, another high name in statistics. And many of us do not know about physicists. Parent is statistician. Then Dr. Bowles joined ISI on PhD work. Then Dr. Melnovis gave him three four volumes, not of volumes of biometric time. That are from UK. So read these. And then when CRO joined this, I mean ISI, Dr. Bowles gave him two books of research. Design of experiments and statistical method for research workers. If you read these, you know statistics. So I think I'm out of time, right? Yes. I'll continue this stretch. So I put these persons, Carl Pearson. I could get 95,000 descendant last figure, I got. I took that the Russian track also. John Hoffman. 95, close to, I was thinking, can it cost 100,000? I could not. So I think I can stop here. If you want, I can. Thank you. Thank you. I think you got close enough to a hundred thousand so that we will allow you that credit. Maybe. <laughs> we want to welcome home one of our own next for our speaker, Dr. Richard. Peterson, he is Associate Professor of Mathematics at Potomac State College in West Virginia. He has got his BS in Mathematics right here at Elizabeth City State University, and an MS in Applied Mathematics and a PhD in Mathematics from North Carolina State University. He does research in city groups, linear algebra, graph theory, and mathematics education. And he's going to share some of that research with us on transformation of city groups. Welcome home, Dr. Peterson. Good to be back after, after all these years. <laughs> started, I started here back in 1999. My first, first semester here, I had Dr. Raskin's <laughs> class for, for differential equations and and, 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 and this is Dr. Sengu for linear algebra first, first, first semester here. And then, then I think in the next, I think in the next semester I had Dr. D for complex variables, and Peter, Peter was in the class with me, and I think our other, our other buddy was there. We, we, all, we, we all sat together and learned, learned all that, learned all that complex variables. And that's eventually what I did my master's degree in was complex variables. So it all, it all started here. And my my PhD, I worked on semi groups, and there was a lot of graph theory, which we learned in Dr. Houston's discrete class. So graph theory, all the linear algebra from from Dr. Sengupta's class, we used a lot of that. So you know, this all the all the math that I worked on in, in my undergrad studies was very useful towards my master's and PhD work and original research. So it all it all started here. My first my first really real original research project. I worked with Dr. Sengupta and with I know it, it was like 2001 when we went to Washington D.C. to 
present that poster to the, at the Capitol, at the Capitol in D.C. So that was 2001. Yeah. 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 Was that was 2001. Yeah, I remember that. That was a that was fun. We got to take a nice tra trip to to D.C. Dr. Pepper Sengupta drove us up there. The <laughs> you know, we, were, we were holding on really tight. <laughs> <laughs> I got to I got to go to uh, go to one of the Indian restaurants with him for dinner. And, yeah. Good, good times. <laughs> good, good food and had a good time staying at that hotel there, seeing some of the museums. And, you know. So it was all all began here, and I'm happy to be back after having been, been a few years since I've been down. Good to see Peter, and Carl, and all my back, former former professors. So I'll tell you a little bit about. A little bit about some of the work work I was doing about transformation semi groups. There's you, you'll see some some linear algebra, some abstract algebra topics you might have heard of before. Uh, the first first business is just kind of a little bit about wild groups. The this this type is the symmetric group, which some of you may be familiar with from. Maybe you're taking the abstract algebra class, heard about the symmetric group with all the all the bijective mappings between the you know between the set one through n, and discrete stuff, just like Dr. Houston was, was introducing us to right? discrete mathematics here. So the set of all the bijections, the symmetric group has order n factorial, right? You can send you, in the symmetric group you can't map one, you can map like one to two, two to three, you have to have a bi have bijective mappings. The semi-groups that I'm talking about, you did not have to have one-to-one -one mappings in the, in the transformation semi-group. So you'll see that a little bit later, that that's different there. So I started by studying the symmetric group back in my undergrad abstract algebra class here with, I had Dr. Ellings in, I'm too bad he didn't. Did you invite him down here? <laughs> yeah. too, that was probably too long of a trip for him coming from he probably had some, had some snow up there already, <laughs> upstate New York. Uh, I worked with the symmetric group to start with. Then I looked at the signed, the signed permutation group, which is another one of the wild groups there. And the signed permutation group, the order of that, it's 2 to the n times n factorial because we have mappings from, you can send 1 to negative 2, 3 to negative 4, 5 to 6, and so on. So you have all those possible <coughs> mappings to the to the you know, between these signed sets from one to eight. Uh, a lot of my a lot of my dissertation concerned something called called wreath products, which is a special type of semi-direct product of two groups. This signed permutation group is an example of a wreath product between this set Z mod 2 and the and the symmetric group. Okay, so the sine permutation group is just a wreath product of Z mod 2 with the, with the symmetric group. So it's a semi-direct product. Uh, I also talked about the wreath product of a general group G and the symmetric group. So we looked at the product of G by itself n times and looked at that wreath product, looked at that semi-direct product with the symmetric group. Um, I'm trying to get to the transformation semi-groups, that's the interesting part. We all, we, most of us know something about the symmetric group already. So the, this wreath product is a semi-direct product of G with itself n times and the symmetric group. And we can define the product of two elements in that wreath product. Okay, so oh, what the product of D again? V2? G, no, G in this case is just a general group. A general group. So, yeah, G to the N is just the product okay. of G. You can yourself that. Yeah. And, with that. and if we take a semi-direct product of that with the symmetric group, oh. okay, there's my, I, this is bringing back memories of, of my classes this week. I like 
blank having these things. <laughs> <laughs> I always have my always have my laser with me. My students are worried that I might point at them and they'll just disappear. <laughs> I haven't got to be powerful enough for that yet. <laughs> so if we take if we take a product of two elements, so a product of two elements in this wreath product is defined in the following manner. So we've got we, we're talking about groups, so these elements have inverses in this case. So I'm just trying to get you a little bit, maybe recall some things about the groups so you can see what's different when we talk about the, the semi-groups. So the product of two elements in this wreath product here comes out this way. Um, so for the semi-groups, for the semi-groups, what's different about semi-groups is the operation only has to be associative. With groups, we know we have to have much more than that. We have to have an identity, and the elements have to be invertible, right? And of course, if they're commutative, we have abelian groups. But with semi-groups, with semi-groups, the operation on S certainly just has to be associative. So there's no requirement for identities and invertibility like we have with Groups. So this is much weaker than group. Yeah. yeah. Well group yeah, groupoids, groupoids are even weaker than semi-groups. Semi-groups you have to have so with, with groupoids, you just have to have a binary operation defined. And if that operation is associative, you get a semi-group. Adding in an identity element makes a monoid. And then if the elements are invertible, then you have a group. Yeah. Now I studied some things called regular semi-groups. So regular semi-groups, if, if there exists an X in S such that, so, so an element A in a semi-group is called regular if there exists an element X in S such that A times X times A gives us back the element A. A semi-group is called regular if all of its elements are regular. And if we have that work for, for units, units U, that's unit regular. Now, this is just giving some idea of, of uh, some of the theorem, some of the background material I was working with in my before I came up with original research there. So, a full transformation semigroup, a full transformation semigroup, it kind of brings back some thoughts about the symmetric group. Its mappings, its mappings from this set to itself. Except these mappings do not have to be one to one like they do in the symmetric groups. You can send it with a, with a, a semi group, transformation semi group, you can have one map to one, two map to one, three map to one. You can have everybody map to one. Right? I can just, you can just think about it like everybody maps to one. I can picture Oprah saying that. Right? <laughs> right? All of you are mapping to one. That can be, a, that can be a, an example of the full transformation semi-group. So the full transformation semi-group is a set of all mappings from this set to the, to the same set. They don't have to be one-to-one -one mappings like in the, in the symmetric group. This full transformation semi-group, it's a regular semi-group. So that means, that means we had all, that means we had these definitions hold for all the elements in the semi-group. So it's a regular semi-group. There's some information about the range and the, the rank, if, if you know, you know those things. That's full transformation semi-group. It's, it's an analog of the symmetric group. It's the semi-group analog of, of the symmetric group. And here's some ways that you can represent the elements in the full transformation semi-group. I mostly, I did a lot of the work with the matrices where if, if if uh, J maps to I, then I put a one in the IJ entry of the n by n matrix. Okay, so that's that was mostly what I was using was those the matrices. And you can do the usual matrix multiplication when you're talking about multiplying elements in the transformation semigroup. You can define it by matrix multiplication. Same same thing you do in linear algebra class. I think I have some examples of oh I didn't put them Swiss. I, I, I really like studying idempotents in, in grad school there. The set of idempotents in the full transformation semigroup. So idempotent elements are ones where when you square them, so E times E gives you back E, right? idempotent elements. If you're taking the, 
those of you that might be taking the linear algebra class here, you probably studied idempotent matrices, nilpotent, and all those good things in there. So the set of idempotents, those are all the elements that have this property. And I should have some. Yeah, here's some here's some examples of idempotents in the in the transformation semigroup T3. Uh, this this is the mapping one to one, two to one, three to one. So everybody goes to one. There's ones all in this, this row of the matrix. Here, so if you take this matrix, times it by itself, you're going to get that same thing again. If you take this matrix times itself, this matrix times itself, you get the same thing back again. So these are some of the item tokens in, in T3. Now, John Howey, which is one of the one of the main uh, books and paper, I study so many papers and I have textbooks and authored by, by John Howe. He was, he was one of the ones that was really you know, influential on, on some of the theorems that I came up with. So in, his, in this paper in 1966, he proved that every, every element of every element of the transformation set, so this means the transformation semi group, if you throw out the, the elements from the symmetric group. Remember when you see that Tn minus Sn means get rid of the symmetric group elements. Every element in here is the product of item potents. So every element in there you can write it as a product of item potents. So, you know, if you pretend that I actually typed this matrix in correctly, it should be this one. I mean the multiplication works out to be that, but you know, I I, I had to make sure I, I put that in there, just, just so somebody would, just, would stay awake and didn't point out. <laughs> <laughs> I, I put that mistake in there intentionally, just to like, just so you notice that. Say, I, I, that guy with the PhD, you know, he, he made a mistake, I caught it. <laughs> you, can, uh, you can go home and feel, feel really good about yourself for that. <laughs> so if, if, you, if you pretend that I, I I type this matrix here as I intended, these two matrices do in fact multiply to that. Each one of those would be an item potent matrix, and I can write any, write any matrix, any any element in here as a product of item potents. Now that wasn't anything I came up with. That was John Howey in 1966. I, you know, my my, uh, my parents were like seven years old when they so they were, they were, they were, I was, I was long before I was going to do any work with semi groups. So there's a semi group, there's a semi group analog of the sign permutation group, and I called it the sign transformation semi group. This sign transformation semi group is also a regular semi group, and this is all the all the mappings that are signed don't have to be one to one. The sign permutation, okay, the sign semi, that sign semi group there, sign transformation semi group is also regular. And this is a theorem that I actually proved was that in the sign semi group, you can also write every element as a product of item potent. So that's an extension of Howley's theorem there that you can write every element there as a product of item potent. So here's an example. You know this. This took a while to figure out how to, how to get that to work out. So these three things had to make, make that matrix right there. So that was one of the theorems that I proved. It was an extension of, of Howey. I also took a look at more information about, uh, more about wreath products there. So if I took this group G with itself, n times, and then took the wreath product, the semi-direct product with the full transformation semi group instead of the symmetric group like I showed you earlier. We have the product, here's how you define the product of elements. Um, I proved, where is it? So here's how, here's what was different about that. Remember how the, in the brief product where this was the symmetric group, you had like the pi inverse in there. In the, in the semi group, we don't have to have invertible elements, so you had to define the mappings in a different way here. So here's how you define the product in this brief product. And again, it's a semi-direct product of the transformation semi-group with a general group G 
to the n, so g times g times g, right? <coughs> you can represent you can represent the elements in this read product by placing an element of the group in the ij entry of the matrix. So something I proved was here's how you multiply its matrix multiplication in some wreath product notation. Okay. This, so here's some of the, so this T hat and, and G hat. Here's some, here's something that, something that I proved was that this, so this, this was kind of pretty new stuff that we were working with. I worked with Dr. Dr. Prucha at NC State and we were working with some of these, these wreath products here. I proved that this wreath product is unit regular. So that means we can write any <coughs> element in the wreath product in this form. So for example, here's an element in this wreath product, and I can write it as a matrix in this T hat times a matrix in this G hat. So that was one theorem that came up with. I also did some work with the idempotent elements, with the idempotent elements in this Wreath product. So some of the idempotent elements look like this, and they look strikingly similar to the ones we talked about in, in T3. You're just replacing some of the entries by, by group elements. Now, I think that was a pretty major theorem that I ended up working on was that every non unit in this read product can be written as a product of idempotents. That was a, that was a, I probably spent month straight just doing nothing but coming up with the proof of that theorem and, and working with all these working out all these different examples. So every non-unit of this read product can be written as a product of item focus. So this is an example of an element in this read product and I can write it as a product of these three matrices here. And here's another example. The units, the units of this read product make up this Wreath product where it's the symmetric group. So G with the symmetric group. So some of those, some that's just give you some idea of what I've been what I've been doing since ECSU. I've been been teaching at Atomic State College of West Virginia University for this is my eighth eighth year up there. That's a that's a two year that's a two year division of West Virginia University. Many of our many of our students come there for the first two years and eventually transfer to the to the main campus. Uh, we take um, we take in a lot of the students that may need a little bit of remediation before heading off to the main campus. Uh, so we're doing some we're doing some good work up there and helping these helping our students become successful in their future at the main campus. Yeah. <laughs> After two years with your college, we will take your students here. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, all began, it, all, it all began here in, in 1999, and, and I'm sure some of you, will, some, some of you that are in the audience will be back here just as many years later <laughs> telling us all about your, your successes and, and how it all started here for you as well. Success, success starts here at ECSU and this fine math and computer science department. Uh, Peterson, thank you very much. I'm sure you're helping your students be successful, but you have also been successful. Oh, yes. And you're working with <laughs> groups, so we appreciate your sharing the research with us. Our next speaker is Dr. Sohini, I mean, Ms. Sohini Singhuta, who is a graduate student, I'm sorry, and um, with the Department of System and Computational Biology at Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri. And obviously, she's on the pathway to an illustrious career, we say all that. She has a BS in Biomedical Engineering and Applied Mathematics and Statistics, and is in her third year as a PhD 
student at McDonald Genome Institute, again at Washington University in St. Louis, under the mentorship of Dr. Lee Ding. Her research is in the area of cancer genomics, and she will be talking to us about using computational approaches to identify cancer-driven mutations. There are two categories of somatic mutations. There are the driver mutations and passenger mutations. 
So driver mutations are the mutations that directly cause tumor initiation and progression. They're responsible for the cancer. Passenger mutations are just background noise in your tumor. They do not directly cause cancer and they're just kind of there. So this has been a major computational challenge in our cancer genomics field, is distinguishing those driver mutations from the passenger mutations. And there have been a variety of computational approaches that have attempted this problem. And they basically try to take all the somatic mutations in a tumor cell and kind of narrow down the list to a highly prioritized list that we can then validate those computational predictions experimentally. So I'm gonna walk through uh, the three major groups of the current computational methods, the gold standards of identifying driver mutations. I'm gonna do this on a broad scale. So the first uh, method uses a frequency-based approach. So it, it identifies um, recurrent mutations across multiple patient samples. So we would expect that mutations that play a direct role in cancer to appear across patient samples more than expected by chance. So for instance, if we have four different tumors from four different patients here, the red triangle indicates where in the genome the mutation occurs. So if you were to look across these samples, so for instance, there's mutations that cluster locally right here. You see that here. So that region is more likely to be a driver, kind of a driver region if you have a mutation in that region. So some of the computational approaches will pinpoint the exact mutation that drives cancer. Other uh, approaches will kind of pinpoint on a broader scale what, what the cancer genes are. So they'll just look at the, uh, the observed mutation rate across the whole gene and compare it to a background mutation rate. And a background mutation rate is, is defined as the probability of finding a passenger mutation anywhere in the genome by chance. And different computational methods differ in terms of how they calculate that BMR. And they say if the observed mutation rate is significantly greater than that background mutation rate, then that's a significantly mutated gene, and it's a cancer gene. All right, so, so this is DNA. Um, you have nucleotides, which then get translated, or sorry, transcribed to RNA. Um, and then each group of three is called codon, and you will translate that into amino acids. And amino acids make up protein. So there's some DNA changes that can directly affect your amino acids. So you end up getting an amino acid chain. These are called dispense mutations. So the second category, um, so the problem with the first category is that it requires a large sample size because you need enough statistical power to find those recurrent mutations. So this approach, instead of using like large sample size and looking across uh, samples, it looks at the specific amino acid chain itself um, in terms of the physiochemical properties. And it will kind of assess how different are the um, properties of the mutant amino, amino acid compared to the original amino acid in terms of um, size, polarity, charge, um, hydrophobicity. So computational approaches will pair, um, pair the properties with evolutionary conservation to make a judgment about a mutation. So for instance, if this is a protein um, sequence of amino acids, and we have a mutation here, uh, we would take this protein and search for all related proteins that kind of came from a common ancestor. And then it will build an alignment, a sequence alignment. It's basically, um, there's parts of the proteins that are similar, and, and this alignment will kind of tell you how those proteins line up. So for instance, we have this protein, <laughs> and we have these two related proteins, we kind of have similar features, some eyes, maybe some facial features. Um, the salina will basically tell you what parts are similar. All right, so after it does the alignment, um, they'll look at your position and kind of calculate a conservation value. So conservation can relate to entropy. So a highly conserved value is low entropy. Like here you can see, um, all of these are the same amino acids, so it's a highly conserved position. If you were to find a mutation at a conserved position, it's more likely to be damaging. Um, and here you can also assess, like this, you'll, you'll assess the properties of all the amino acids found at this position, and if the mutant amino acid differs widely from the majority of the properties found in that position, then it could also be damaging. Like for instance, this is a hydrophobic position, but if you were to find a hydrophilic, mutation, then it's more likely to be damaging. 
Um, so the last method uses pathway analysis. So proteins rarely act in isolation. Um, proteins interact with other proteins to maintain normal function in pathways, um, and they vary in terms of their mutation rate. So if you're going to just pull a single protein from a pathway, you may not be able to identify it as a cancer gene because it's not, it doesn't have a statistically significant mutation rate. But if you were to look at the collective mutation rate of all the genes in the pathway, that pathway can be significantly mutated, and then you would classify that as a cancer pathway. So gene set enrichment analysis is uh, one computational method that looks at pathway analysis. So here, it's very simple. It would just rank the gene list, a large gene list, in terms of mutation rate. And if we have a predefined set that we know are related to each other, um, we'll pull those out and see where they, where they fall in this ranking. And if they fall at higher ranks than expected by chance, then they'll say, that's a cancer pathway. Um, so the problem with this is that you need prior knowledge of what genes are in the same pathway or what gene sets you want to study. So this kind of deters the ability to identify novel cancer pathways. So in order to identify novel cancer pathways, you need de novo approaches. And obviously the most naive way to do that is to look at all the genes and assess every combination and then assess the mutation rate of all those combinations, which is not the smartest way to do it. It's extremely computationally heavy. So instead we can focus on specific combinations, which is what the tool Dendrix does. Um, so it's hypothesized that if you have a tumor, a tumor sample, that there are relatively few driver mutations within that sample that come from the same pathway. Rather that each driver mutation comes from distinct pathways to enact different molecular me mechanisms throughout cancer progression. So that's kind of what this algorithm is based off of. So you would expect um, driver mutations from genes in the same pathway are mutually exclusive in the same sample. So then this algorithm right here looks for those patterns of mutual exclusivity. So if the columns represent the genes and then the rows represent different patient samples, you'll see that there's a mutation in this gene right here. There's not a mutation in that gene. So this algorithm will then group these two genes together and say they're in the same pathway. Similarly, you can see that here, um, that these are possibly cancer pathways. All right, so I'll briefly talk about kind of what my approach is and what I've started doing my thesis on. Um, so here you see protein sequence, and this is a linear sequence, right? So, but this, this protein can fold into a 3D structure, which is ultimately what governs function. It's not this linear sequence. But a lot of these approaches don't consider the 3D structure. They just simply look at the linear sequence. For instance, when I talked about frequency-based approaches, it looks for clustering of um, mutations locally, and that's how they identify driver mutations. But you can have, there's instances where you can have mutations that fall far apart on the primary sequence, but if you were to look at them in 3D space, they cluster very closely. And these would also be driver mutations, but using traditional approaches, these mutations are missed. Um, so it's my hypothesis that if you were to look at passenger mutations, they would kind of fall randomly throughout the protein structure. Versus driver mutations will cluster more closely in functional regions, because they tell you which regions are actually important for the normal function of your protein. So my approach has been to kind of take all this cancer patient mutation data and display them on proteins and then identify significant clustering of mutations on protein structure. So I'll just walk through a very broad level of how I do this. Um, so the first step would be to take a protein structure, calculate all the pairwise residue distances, and that will give you your background distribution here. And then I would focus on only the pairs of mutations that have distances in the tail end. So now I'll call these significantly proximal pairs of mutations. So using those pairs, we would form the initial cluster. And here I use single link agglomerative clustering, and that basically is a fancy word for saying it's the most naive way to do it, is if there's a mutation here, and it's paired with another mutation, you will add it to the cluster. And if you have a new mutation that's paired with a mutation already in the cluster, you'll just add it. You keep on linearly adding it. So the problem with this is that 
you get this linear chaining phenomenon where you get a cluster of unbounded size. So like your last mutation that you add to the cluster can be significantly far from the first one. It's not guaranteed that everything is close by. And we want clusters that are relatively focused in size. So to fix that, we can model um, this initial cluster as a graph. And graph consists of vertices and edges. So a vertice um, will represent an original mutation in this cluster. And the edges will represent if they are significantly proximal to each other. So in this case, not every mutation will have an edge with another mutation because they may not be significantly proximal. But to kind of bypass that problem, we can kind of do a walk on the network and calculate the shortest path from each mutation to every other mutation. And there are already algorithms out there. We use the Floyd Marshall shortest path algorithm, the common one. Um, and after that, you need to identify the center of the network. And here, these are weighted nodes, and we weight the mutation by how, how many samples is it found in. And we want the center of the network to be the, the mutations that are found in a lot of samples, as well as close to other mutations that are highly recurrent. And after we identify that, we can focus the cluster by applying a radius limit away from that center. And we would only include mutations that are in that radius limit in the final cluster. So after doing this, um, we set up a, a pipeline to kind of prioritize clusters based on how enriched they are in mutations and how close the mutations are spatially. And based on that, you can pull the, the most significant clusters and see what mutations are in them, and those give indication of what can be a driver of mutation. All right, so I just want to end with um, why computation. Computation is very important in my field. I don't think it can progress without computation just because you're not looking at just one gene. You're looking at a whole genome, which is why it's going to base pairs. And you can't manually analyze that. So you need to automate things. We have large, noisy, high throughput data sets, and with any of them, the, the bottlenecks in research um, hinge on computational issues like speed, scalability, energy, cost, efficiency. And there's this need for machine learning, statistical reasoning, um, programming um, in order to make meaningful biological conclusions. So just a picture of my lab at Washington Genome Institute, and that's my PI, Dr. Lee Ding, who is a very well-known um, scientist in the cancer genome field. And she birthday.
on December the 17th, because it's definitely being here is worth it. So, so happy birthday to you. <laughs> um, so first, uh, before I get started, I want to say uh, a bit of thanks. Uh, first of all, I want to just say, give a public shout out to uh, two uh, doctors that are in the room that have been a great influence on my life, whether they know it or not. Uh, Dr. Richard Peterson was actually my Calculus 1 and Calculus 2 tutor here at Elizabeth City State University. And of course, uh, Dr. Peter Ely, we're members of the same fraternity. I remember when I wanted to join uh, be the student government president, I would file for a one and only. And I remember when I wanted to uh, be SGA president here on our campus and actually talk to Dr. D about it. And he said two words. Peter Ely, if you can do it, you can do it. So I was like, <laughs> the president, and, and there I was. So Peter and Richard, it's always good seeing you. So, and I became a student here uh, not too long after Richard came in August of 2000. I'm from Portsmouth, Virginia, which is not too far from here. And uh, the night before uh, classes, I walked through Lester Hall. And, I love ECSU. My first two degrees are from ECSU. But in terms of the math department, I do think there's a difference between Lester Hall mathematicians and Lane Hall. <laughs> Not to create any division. So we were from the family of Lester Hall mathematicians. When I was walking across the second floor uh, of that building the night before our classes, and classes started on a Tuesday, as I presume they do now, I saw a picture uh, and I don't know what you guys are doing, but Richard was in the picture, a young lady, Carol Kaplan with braids in the picture. And I said, wow, for a small school tuck in northeastern North Carolina, they're, they're pretty active with research. And so it made me think I'm definitely in the right place at the right time. But looking at that picture also made me think of uh, and being a student here at Elizabeth City State University, as homogeneous as it may seem, uh, it taught me that research as a, profession, as a student and then as a professional is extremely important. And embracing diversity is extremely important. Certainly, uh, I'm a little darker, not too much than Richard, but when, we <laughs> but when we interacted with one another, we were like brothers. And when a group of us were saying, oh, we, Dr. Harold Ellington, we're failing his class. <laughs> like, you have two nerves. So it taught me that research was important and diversity is important, and not just racial diversity, that's what a lot of people think about, but cultural diversity, regional diversity. And so you embrace those things, and I was very fortunate to embrace those things uh, here at Elizabeth City State University. And I did look at that poster and I said, you know what, this is gonna be hard. But my life did not get hard until my uh, fall semester, and I was enrolled in Math 354. Uh, and I don't know what the section number for abstract algebra is now, but that was the section number for abstract algebra then. And up to that point, with the exception of that calculus, well, I don't know what Dr. Allison was talking about, but with the exception of that class, I had performed pretty well in my courses. But Dr. Singuta, and of course this is in Lester Hall, there was a small room, it had two rows, maybe eight chairs a piece, you guys will remember, a stadium seating for 16 people. Five people walked into that abstract algebra class. And then Dr. Singuta, he wore his traditional sweater and collared shirt. <laughs> and he walks in there, notebook, seven sheets of paper. He goes to the chalkboard, he starts talking, and he does not look at those papers for 51 minutes. <laughs> so I said, you know what? This is about to get real. <laughs> very real. Uh, but certainly, that class taught me to be very prepared uh, because I did not have to prepare as much for my classes. Uh, at that point. So Dr. Singh, before I begin formally, I want to say to you, for those of you guys that are math nerds and or read The Hunger Games, this will sound familiar to you, may the odds ever be in your favor. <laughs> so my road to being a math coach actually started here at Elizabeth City State University. A lot of people don't know that my mother is physically disabled, and so as a byproduct of that, we, my twin brother and I, we grew up in poverty. So when I went, wanted to go to college, I wanted to major in something that I could get money on. So when I came to Elizabeth City State University, I actually started in the Davis School of Business and Economics, and I wanted to be an economics major. My plan was, I'm gonna major in economics, I'm gonna go to Wall Street, I like math, I'm gonna make all this money. You have to remember, I went to school in the 2000s, so the stock market was doing very well, people was making money left and right in the late 90s, and I kinda wanted to be a part of that success. And then my mother, 
who was not college educated, she had the wisdom and the foresight enough to tell my twin brother and I, listen, you don't want to go to college and major in something just to make money because you'll be miserable. Do something that you like. And so I had an opportunity to apply for a scholarship. And that's re the real story of how I majored in mathematics. I don't have one of these, oh, I've always loved math for the rest of my life, and then I majored. I don't have that. That's not my story. That is not my story. So again, I alluded to the Lester Hall Mathematics Department. And for those people that are just students here at Elizabeth City State University, Peter and Richard will appreciate this because they were here before me. At ECSU, it was about the same size it is now 15 years ago when I first got to Kansas, except the E.D. Wilkins Academic Computing Center had 30 computers, and that was the technology hub of the entire <laughs> campus. There was no two-story ITC building there. So those 30 computers, that was it. And the math and computer science department, even though it's one department, was in two physically different locations. The math department was actually in Lester Hall, and all the computer science courses were taught. Now, let me hit the pause button. Not only is E.B. Wilkins the center of all the computers, during the day, that's where all the computer science classes were. So if you wanted to type a paper, or if you wanted to run your program in Boiling C++, you had to sneak into a class to do that, while Dr. Lucardi was teaching CSC 121 or whatever he thought. And so, but the one good thing that I, I miss it and haven't had an opportunity to go here for graduate school as well in the Lane Hall Math Department, what I miss about the Lester Hall Math Department because is that we were really tight. It didn't matter what year you graduated or didn't graduate, people worked with you and it, and it was an environment that, that almost set up success. And Dr. Deason, which is a huge part of that success. So uh, the small classes I alluded to with the uh, uh, math uh, 354 class, and here's the deal, especially 